So we're back for the second portion of the morning, and um, this one will be focused on biochip-based separation and detection. And what I'll be talking about, um, we're really focused on the separation and detection portion of the fully integrated instrument that uh, we're building. Um, from the morning session, as you remember, we have, uh, we're building several modules to a fully in integrated biochip. We have a module one, which is purification and quantification, module two, which is STR amplification, and module three, which is separation and detection. Um, we've worked most, we worked first on the separation and detection module of the integrated biochip and have um, essentially completed development on this. And much of the, um, this portion of um, the presentation will focus on the separation and detection portion. Um, a picture of the instrument. This is GeneBench um, FX Series 100. And you'll see this in the lab, so I won't go through much of a um, discussion on this at this point. But um, as you know, it does um, STR analysis, and this is a profile from the identifier kit. So it does multiplex um, STR analysis, and in this case, it does five colors. But as you'll see, it's compatible with um, most of the kits that are available, the four, four color kits and also the five color kits that are commercially available. Um, in terms of the, um, the GeneBench Series 100, it is one module of the fully integrated um, system. And this module really just does separation and detection. So to operate this system, you still need to extract DNA or collect DNA the standard way, extract DNA the standard way, you know, using your pipettes or robots or what have you. Um, amplify DNA still the standard way. But then once you have your PCR product, you would mix it with um, formamide, mix it with size standard, and then you can insert it into the chip. And this will be the um, biochip for the FX100. The biochip would be inserted into the chip chamber of the instrument and then um, be run to, to get the STR profiles. Um, what's important about module three, it's critical for the fully integrated system as we had talked about before because um, um, So it's critical for the fully integrated system. And then it's also critical because we've designed it for a field forward operation so that it's, it's really ruggedized for both in lab use and in the field use. And if you had to move it, you would not need to, uh, to, uh, to recalibrate it. Um, in terms of the design requirements for this instrument, we've designed it so that it performs um, um, with, with our philosophy of performing at least equal or better than conventionally available devices. And what that really means is that we designed this instrument so that it has resolution that's um, better, sensitivity and precision that's better, and, and um, all of these results I'll show you over the course of the next, this presentation or the next presentation. And then, uh, of course, you'll get to see it in the demo and then uh, the data analysis tomorrow. Um, the GeneBench FX platform consists of a 16-lane microfluidic biochip. Um, it's based on electrophoretic separation. So in terms of that, um, it still uses an electric field. It still moves DNA through a sieving matrix so that the DNA that's small can move more rapidly and the DNA that's large moves slowly. And that's how sizing takes place electrophoretically. Um, it's based on laser-induced fluorescence detection so that um, we have dye primers that are used in PCR amplification and these dye primers generate fragments that are labeled um, with one of four or five colors depending on your kit. And um, in this system, you excite these labels and then detect to tell what colors they are. And then with time, you can use, uh, um, determine the size. It's ruggedized for field use and it has low power consumption. And what that really means is that you can plug a series of these, three or four of them onto a wall outlet and not worry about blowing fuses. And this is important if you want to have it uh, both in a lab that has constraints on power and then also if you want to have it um, mobile in, in a van that's running on battery power. Um, it's CE marked for a low voltage directive and this means that um, this instrument has all the interlocks, both electrical, the electromagnetic interference, and then also uh, um, safety interlocks so that people that are not uh, uh, really familiar with the instrument can operate it. 
And CE Marking is um, just an organization that um, certifies th these types of, uh, of requirements. And you can see it on a lot of your devices. You know, if you flip over any electronic device, it'll have this little CE mark. Um, and um, in order to get that, you essentially build a system, you send, you uh, perform all the required testing on the CE requirements list and submit the, uh, the requirements to say that this instrument meets that. So um, the bottom line for a user is that it's safe to use. You don't have to wear laser safety glasses because no light beam is going to shoot and hit you in the eye or, uh, or the uh, high voltage supplies are all protected so that you can't open the chamber while it's running and get thousands of volts zapping on you. Um, the current dimensions you'll see it in the lab, um, but it's essentially this big and it weighs about 53 kilograms, so that's about 100 pounds. Um, two people, one person can carry it, two people, it's much easier. Um, the glass microfluidic chip um, is shown in this picture. We have glass and plastic, um, but in this case, um, you'll see that uh, the separation chip is, is uh, essentially around 16 to 20 um, centimeters in separation length. Um, it has sample wells so that you can insert samples, 16 of them, 16 independent samples into the chip. And um, it has a detection area where all the samples that move down the microfluidic channels will end up getting zapped by the laser so that they emit fluorescence and get detected. Um, the in designing this system, there were really three components um, of importance. One is the, the design of the, the instrument, which is the power supply, the optics, and the, um, the electronics. The second one is the, integrate, is the uh, biochip itself, the separation lengths, the channel dimensions. And the third one is, um, is uh, the, the sieving matrix. So the three of these elements together really give you resolution, signal strength, uh, performance that you require for a uh, forensics lab. So what we did was, um, in designing this machine, designing the chip, and designing the sieving matrix, really tried to optimize it so that it would work for uh, uh, the requirements of the forensics analysis. And what that really means is that um, for, for the separation chip, we selected a separation length that would give us the resolution we needed to 500 base pairs, because for STR separations, um, somewhere around 380 to 400 would be required for the AB systems and somewhere 450 to 480 for the Promega systems. So we designed one that would give us performance up to about 500. Um, and this would be for the length of the separation channel. And at the same time, we also designed um, a sieving matrix, optimizing it so that it, it would perform in this range of um, fragment sizes. Um, in terms of um, the sieving matrix, um, there are some key parameters that uh, I'll show it that we have optimized for, and that is for resolution, signal strength, mobility, and viscosity. And I think this plot is not coming out very clearly, but I just wanted to, uh, um, to give you a snapshot for what um, one of the parameters that is really important in terms of DNA separation and resolution would be. And this parameter is essentially the, uh, the, the concentration of acrylamide or the concentration of your polymer within your sieving matrix. So if you can see here, um, this is 9.3 and 10 on tho one So as you know, they're single base separated. Um, you'll see that um, for this concentration of polymer, which is high, the peak to value ratio is very, very high. So you essentially get uh, baseline resolution. And as you decrease the polymer, um, concentration, the resolution decreases. So this value goes up higher and higher to the point where if you reduce it to one that is amenable for genome sequencing, um, you get relatively poor resolution in this range. But um, of course, for genome sequencing, you care about going to 1,000 or 1,100 base pairs. So the optimization for that sieving matrix is really um, not compatible for one that's used for STR analysis. So we really um, considered forensics applications and uh, the base sizes that were used in forensics um, to, to develop a sieving matrix that was applicable for it. Uh, 
Um, before I get into uh, biochip separations, I just wanted to give this overview, this little sketch of uh, conventional CE. I think you guys use these instruments, so you know it probably quite well. And essentially, this is the capillary electrophoresis type of instrument that's used you know, in AB system or a, and in this type of system, you have two vials. One vial that uh, um, holds buffer, and, and one vial that initially holds sample that you load into the capillary, and then you would exchange it for buffer to make the separations. Um, in here, you have the capillary, and the sample that moves along the, uh, the capillary gets um, separated by size as it moves through the electric field. Um, in the CE, conventional CE system, there is a laser, and this laser will impinge on a certain portion of your capillaries, usually closer to the end of it. And um, it would shine on um, one lane or 16 lanes of the, the instrument, depending on what you would have. The laser that, um, that impinges onto the, the capillary would then excite the fluorophores on, on the label primers. And that would excite, and that would end up generating um, colors. You know, one of five colors if you use an AB kit, one of four colors if you use uh, Promega or the uh, Profiler Cofiler kits. And these colors then get picked up um, through a wavelength discriminator. So what that happens is um, the light comes through, and the wavelengths of the colors get split into bins, and gets picked up by detectors so that um, you know for each of the colors the signal get that that's reported. And that really tells you two things. One is the, the color of the dye or the color of the fragment that's been <coughs> labeled and the size of the fragment. And the size of the fragment comes from the separation time that it takes to get from the sample portion over to the, um, the waste portion. Um, the same thing also happens for um, biochips. Um, it's not different. Um, the primary difference between the two systems um, in terms of the, uh, the way electrophoresis takes place is that in the biochip, it's on a planar substrate. So all the channels are physically located. They don't move like a capillary. They're etched into the substrate and they're located uh, physically on the plane and in a very reliable pattern. And that, that becomes really important because um, um, with the, with the biochip, having small channels and having them locate very precisely on the chip allows you to align very easily. So in terms of the biochip um, separation, you have the same thing going on. In the biochip, you have a channel with two holes. And if you remember the glass biochips, these holes are drilled in. So these two holes allow you to, first of all, fill it with sieving matrix within the biochip. And then secondly, allows you to insert the sample in to form a plug that then gets separated. Um, within the biochip, we also apply voltages, so negative on the um, cathode side, and we ground the anode side. And by application of this voltage, because um, DNA is inherently negatively charged, the DNA would then move through the sieving matrix all the way to the ground from this end of the channel to this end. Um, the sieving matrix as you and the size of the, the length of the channel are optimized so that the mobility and eventually the uh, resolution of the separation is dictated uh, by the two. So small fragments tend to move through more rapidly and will get to the detector first and then large fragments take longer to get to the detector. Um, in the biochip, we also use laser-induced fluorescence, very similar to the uh, um, capillary system. So there is a laser. This laser impinges onto the fluorophores, gets through a wavelength splitting device, and then each of the detector picks up one of the four or five colors and allows you to uh, both size and discriminate by color the fragments that are coming out. So the important thing about biochip separation is that uh, um, it's very similar to CE. It's not really, the, the newness of the technology is related to the formatting. So in one case, with the CE with capillaries, you have these capillary bundles that, are, um, that have to be placed into vials. 
um, that have to be uh, secured together so that you can scan or detect all of the channels. But then in the biochip technology, all of these channels are physically placed in the biochip in a certain fashion, fixed format, and it's flat. Um, aside from that, the two technologies are very similar. You both have you both use uh, a sieving matrix to fill through through the channels through, through the capillaries. You have to apply a voltage to move the DNA in both cases, and as well, you have to use the laser and detectors to excite the fluorophores and detect each of the wavelengths of colors. Um, in terms of um, um, detection of wavelengths, um, this is one a version of uh, a detection system that's used. And this is similar to what we use in uh, the GeneBench FX. So it's uh, in, if you remember the system, it has a, a chip chamber, we call it. And that's where your glass biochip is placed. And this is a, kind of a sketch of the glass biochip in cross section. You'll see it's flat. And it has 16 channels. And the channels are relatively small. They're approximately 40 microns in radius. Um, and 16 of them. And this um, biochip, the channels are located precisely within the channels because they're physically etched or, or injection molded within the channel. Um, to get, to get um, light from the laser to the biochip, we, we start off with the laser. And this laser um, emits light that goes in a very small directed um, format. So it's essentially a beam like out of a light pointer through a, through a dichroic mirror and up to a scanning mirror. And what the scanning mirror does is it rotates ever so slightly. And by rotating it, we can access lane number one, two, three, four, up to 16. And in, a, in, a, in operation, what ends up happening is that um, we would interrogate lane one through 16 and then go back and interrogate lane one through 16 again. And we do that repeatedly. And um, that's how we um, interrogate 16 samples or 16 channels at the same time. Now, if a fluorophore is present, then light gets emitted. The light gets emitted from the chip, comes almost back instantaneously, hits the scanning mirror, and then goes down through this path to the dichroic mirror. So the reason it's called a dichroic mirror is that it's um, two colors, dichroic. And dichroic really. Um, in the simplest sense means that it'll pass one color and it'll reflect the other color. So for this particular appl application, the laser is usually in the sort of the 500 nanometer range or short wavelength. And that would be the blue or the greenish color. And the fluorophores, as you know, FAM is kind of bluish and then all the way up to LIS, which we think it's orange. It's stated as orange. But uh, essentially, these are long wavelength um, um, portions of light. So when the um, fluorophore comes down, it hits the mirror. And because it's long wavelength, it reflects. It doesn't go back into the laser. So it reflects, and then it goes down this path into the uh, detector box. And in the detector box, we end up with four more dichroic mirrors. And these dichroic mirrors can be selected for uh, different wavelength cutoffs. So if you want to split um, FAM and the next one, or FAM and LIS, for example, two sides of the spectrum, you would pick a dichroic cutoff somewhere in between the two. And what that would mean is that the FAM would go straight through, and the LIS, which is the long wavelength, would get reflected. So let's see how that works here. If you had two wavelengths coming down here, say FAM on the short end, and then LIS on the long end, the two wavelengths would come into this box, FAM being the um, the short wavelength would go through and get to this detector. And Liz would go through this way and get detected by this detector. So if you had two colors coming in, you can now detect with detector 1 and detector 4, and you would know what wavelength of light was coming through, you know, either FAM or Liz. And if you followed down this analogy where you have two closely spaced PET, PET and VIC, or the other dyes, and you selected a wavelength for the dichroic mirror such that they would be in between the wavelengths of each of these um, particular dyes. Then you could essentially take five colors coming in, split them so that each of the detector, one through five, would detect a different color of dye. And the, these dyes um, 
as we have configured the system, correspond to the, uh, the five dies for the identifier set. And incidentally, we've designed it so that it also detects, without reconfiguration, the four die kits as well. starting to get uh, hard to see because the resolution is low, but uh, this is just an STR profile 9947 for um, um, run on GeneBench. And typically what we do on GeneBench is to use um, 2.7 microliters of PCR product. We mix it with uh, formamide and sizing standard. We use Liz GS500 in this case and form a 13 microliter uh, volume that gets inserted into the chip. Um, through separation and detection, we get this type of profile. And as you can see, it, um, it for one nanogram, and you would expect that, um, essentially a full profile. Um, this plot here is just with another, another kit, a four-color kit, just to show that with the same system we can detect um, both four-color kits and five-color kits at the same time. Um, one thing we'd like to highlight, and that's because we spent a lot of effort optimizing for this particular application, is the resolution of, uh, of this system. And the system really includes the instrument, the chip, and the, the, the sieving matrix as well. And for this system, as you can see, 9.310, we get very good um, resolution between these, these two alleles, uh, singly spaced. The, um, peak to valley ratio is very high. So there is actually, there is no ambiguity in terms of whether you have one allele or two alleles in this case. Um, to operate the, um, the instrument, and a lot of this we'll see as well in the demonstration. To operate the instrument, it's relatively straightforward. Um, once you prepare your samples, you load it into your chip, you would insert it into the, um, the instrument itself, close the chamber, and there's a series of um, um, buttons next that you have to click uh, to get from one step to the other. But the key, the key shots that one would see is a data collection shot. And this data collection shot allows you to transfer, sys transfer your data um, between a limb system, if you had one, to, to the instrument and then from the instrument back. And that allows you to really track um, the samples that are on board of the specific chip. It also tracks some of the reagents that are used, specifically the sieving matrix and the buffers, and then also the chip, because for the, uh, the uh, separation instrument that, that we'll be showing, GeneBench FX, every single run is made on a separate chip. So you would be loading your samples into the chip, inserting it into the instrument. You'd prepare another chip, and once this was done, you could take it out, insert your next chip. So um, this software allows you to track the chips and the samples that are associated with that chip. Um, there's a parameter window that allows you to um, configure the separation conditions and the detection conditions. And um, this parameter window has two levels of um, administration. So in the first level, you would just have a user um, capability where you would come up and select a particular method file, the standard one for running. And in sort of the super user mode, you could go in and, and uh, change all the parameters if you like. Um, because this instrument, in this instrument, you have to, you insert a new chip every time. Um, it also has its own software to calibrate from chip to chip. Um, and specifically, what that means is that when you insert a new chip into the chamber, you don't have to realign the optics. Rather, the system will scan across the chip with the laser and identify where on the biochip each of the 16 lanes reside. And by doing that, it then comes back and tells the instrument that um, here are the 16 locations, and then we can start the scan. Because as you know, every biochip is uh, is relatively similar, but even small changes in um, location because you're removing it and placing it back in the system can affect performance. So by using a lane finding algorithm, you can really get to the center of every single lane every single time. And that maximizes performance, both in terms of signal strength and then also reproducibility in signal. Mm. 
And then the final screen that uh, comes up is the operational screen. And the screen really just tells you um, um, what's happening in each of the 16 lanes. You can toggle from lane 1 to 4, 5 to 9, 10 to 12, and then 13 to 16. And, and uh, from this particular plot, you can see the primers coming out and then the alleles that are showing as you make your run. Um, it also tracks currents in the systems, the voltages, the detector parameters, and then also it has a runtime log that tells you which step is being performed, how long it'll take, and when the next step will be ready to run. Um, and then finally, with, uh, with respect to uh, uh, trace processing and allele calling, um, what, what NetBio has written is a series of trace processing software um, which converts the raw data into a format that can be imported into um, allele calling software for processing. Um, the software that we currently use, and um, I, I should be clear about this in that um, we're not tied necessarily to one package or the other, it just happened that this software works for us, um, is Gen GeneMarker HID by Soft Genetics. So what we do is we take our process data, um, import it into GeneMarker, and that, let, that lets us call up the loci and label the alleles within the, the trace. In terms of performance on, on GeneBench, um, this plot here shows a, a profile of 0.1 nanogram PCR template in uh, the standard reaction. And this is, we used a four color kit in this case. And then this plot here shows a 0.25 nanogram. Uh, what you see is um, that at 0.1 nanogram, um, we can get full profiles, and at 0.25 nanograms, we always get full profiles. Um, in terms of signal to noise, which is from a, uh, from a, a development standpoint or engineering standpoint, um, the parameter that we track, um, what we do is we try to understand how much of a tolerance we have for a given signal, how much of it is above the noise. And that really gives you the discrimination between whether a signal is really present or is it just a noise spike. And um, signal to noise just simply is defined by the level of the signal over the standard deviation of this baseline. And from a, a, an experimental standpoint, if you have a signal to noise of about six, you can discriminate with high confidence that a signal is present and that it's not a noise spike that's, um, that's uh, present instead. So in terms of um, the three channels, so blue, green, and yellow in this case, if we plot signal to noise and try to ex extrapolate a bit based on the template, input template from these signals, we see that we can actually detect, um, if we could amplify, around 10 pico. 10 picograms of template into a PCR product and still get signal to noise of greater than six. And this really just speaks to the sensitivity of the instrument. And it, it's important to us mainly because we feel that if we were to amplify um, sort of one copy, if, if we could do that reliably, um, we, would be, we would want to also detect it um, with and be confident that that signal was detectable. Um, the second thing about GeneBench to talk about is the template dynamic range. And in this plot here, what we did was uh, essentially just amplify PCR product going from um, around 0.1 nanograms all the way up to 6 nanograms. And what you see here is the detector signal counts and for each of the template levels that we've used. Um, this black bar here, which is represents the saturation level of the instrument. And um, what you see is that um, from one nanogram to six, it's fairly linear. And that at six nanograms, the signals from the detectors are in the uh, 45,000 um, count range. Uh, remember, the black bar is at about 65,000 counts. So with this system, we don't saturate um, in terms of the, the allele signal strength, even if we input six nanograms of uh, template into the PCR product. 
Um, we've run higher as well. And um, we, we usually say six nanograms, but within the lab, we've run up to 10 nanograms of uh, PCR product without saturating the detectors. Uh, this slide here um, just shows the peak morphology at the uh, high DNA input level. So while we have high DNA um, input template range, you know, that's not the end all because as you know, if you increase your um, template into the PCR product, you start getting other artifacts like uh, incomplete nucleotide addition, not going all the way, for example. And the reason I show this um, plot mainly is to show that um, at, in this case, six nanograms, we don't get saturation of the peak, so the morphology of the, uh, the <coughs> adenylated peaks are still, still good, no flat topping, etc. And uh, secondly, that the uh, template strand, which is here, is easily resolvable. So as you know, these are single base pair apart, so you can still see them very clearly. Um, in terms of precision and repeatability, the um, the way we run this experiment is essentially just insert um, a lelic ladder in each of the 16 lanes and run it, make, make a number of runs, and try to determine what the deviation, the maximum deviation um, for each of the alleles over all the 16 samples within the chip, and then between chip to chip. So what we, we see is that um, we have a maximum deviation of 0.15 base pairs. And this is true for all of the loci um, in this kit. Um, and really, this just translates into um, the system meeting the requirements for the 0.5 uh, base pair binning. Run represents one flight of 16. 16 allelic ladders, right. Yeah. Um, one of the things I've been talking about is uh, um, you know, getting the fully integrated process from start to finish to complete in our target 30 minutes. So in order to do that, uh, one of the things we have to do is really reduce separation times and separation times for up to 500 base pairs because we're still going to be using you know, the 16 loci kits, for example. So what we have here, what I have here is um, um, uh, this is a four color kit, and this is um, a 400 base pair size standard. This is HD 400, and this is the allelic ladder. So for the standard separation condition that um, we used initially, our separations take approximately 25 minutes to complete. But as we have been optimizing, we are now at the point where we can complete separations in about 15 minutes, going up to 400 bases. Um, so you would think there, there is some type of compromise that one has to pay to go from 25 minutes down to 15. And that's somewhat true, but um, the compromise we pay is in resolution. So for a, for a 25 minute separation, we have very high um, resolution already between the 9.3 9 and 10 um, alleles. But if we go down to the 15-minute um, separation, we just lose a little bit of resolution, but still essentially get um, baseline resolution. So by optimizing the sieving matrix and the, uh, the separation chip itself and the separation conditions, we can now accomplish 15-minute separations with very high resolutions. And this fits well with our requirement to get to a, a, a very short sample in to results out analysis time. Um, in terms of the protocol, so for the standard protocol and for the fast protocol, uh, these are the, the, the allelic profiles, STR profiles for, um, for them, standard being on this side and the fast. There is no difference in, uh, significant difference in the, uh, the signal strength of the alleles. And then as you can see, um, Yeah, and so I should say that this is a one nanogram profile, so there's no significant difference in the signal strength, and all of the profiles are still relatively s similar in terms of the balance from locus to locus. In terms of the uh, resolution between the standard and the fast protocol, um, this is another plot just from the analysis of that run you saw previously. 
And that is um, that there is no significant difference in the resolution as well between the 9.3 and 10s for the standard and the FAST protocol. It looks like this, the FAST protocol may be slightly better, but um, you know, it's approximately the same. Uh, we've done some mixture analysis for for the uh, for the system, and what we see here is essentially a um, three three samples, and sample number one having a 0.1 nanogram of donor one, 0.9 nanograms of donor two. Uh, sample two is 0.3 and 0.7, donor one and two, and then 0.5 and 0.5, and you can see in this blue trace for the identifier kit, um, 0.1 nanograms and 0 0.9, 0 0.3, 0 0.7, and then 0.5 and 0.5 nanograms. So it's, uh, and the same thing holds as well for the uh, 0.1, for the same sample set through the um, other alleles in the kit. These are the green, green traces the yellows, and the red traces. Yeah. The instrument is also compatible for, um, for DNA analysis with the, the new kits, and that is the, uh, the mini-STR kits, which are starting to become, um, become used. And this this STR profile we generated with um, an NCO2 allelic ladder um, that we, we got from John Butler. And as you can see with the standard protocol for this specific sample, we can get um, separation, and I think the NCO2 has 120 base pairs for the, the, uh, the largest fragment size. Um, we can get up to 120 base pairs in about nine minutes, let's say 10 minutes. But with the fast separation protocol, we can get up to 120 base pairs in seven minutes. Um, the resolution is still fairly good. So this sample is, is uh, quite special because it has one, two, four sets of um, alleles in the allelic ladder that are singly, single base pair spaced. And you can see here that they're resolved very clearly all the way through. Um, an STR profile for a, for a mini filer kit. So we just ran that just to make sure that the instrument would respond. Um, it's a five color die set, quite similar to the identifier kit. So we picked that up. And um, this is a profile that we get for, um, I think, one nanogram. And then the other thing that the uh, the instrument um, can do is DNA sequencing. So as you know, it's, a, uh, it's an electrophoretic laser-induced fluorescence-based system. So given that, it really has the properties to not only do STR sizing, but also DNA sequencing as well. So we put its DNA sequencing capability to test. And um, the first thing we, we can show is that for DNA sequencing, we can get a FRED score of QB20 or greater for 490 nucleotides and a FRED score of QB30 or greater for 390 nucleotides. So what that really means is that um, um, in the sequencing world, that um, for a QB20, you have one error in about 100 um, calls, and we can do that at 490, and that's the requirement for ge genome sequencing. Um, this, this translates Two, allowing us to get um, mitochondrial DNA sequences. So HV1 is somewhere in the 450 range, and HV2 is around 400 nucleotides. And with this QV score capability, we're able to sequence um, both the mi mitochondrial DNA sequences from HV1 and HV2. And what you see here are the um, base call traces from two donors that were supplied with the uh, uh, primers for primer and sample from Mike Coble. And what you see here is really just the two traces and the, um, the differences in the, in the bases at um, two locations. This location and I think it's actually this one here. 
Yeah. This blue one over here. Yeah. So in terms of um, compatibility with commercial kits, we talked about this, but um, um, the, the instrument is compatible with the five color kits. We run them with five colors, um, identifier and mini filer. We also run them with the four color sets, the profiler, cofiler, <coughs> SGM plus. And we can do that without recalibrating the optics. We can, in fact, run both types of kits or all the types of kits on the same chip lane one being one kit, two, three, four, as long as you can pull out the data and analyze them separately. Um, so that's that's possible. And then um, it's, it's also compatible with the PowerPlex 16 kit as well. Yeah. So, just in summary, in terms of the in terms of GeneBench, the uh, uh, what I wanted to show through these sets of slides is that um, GeneBench is a separation and de detection tool that's critical to the integrated system, and that it's also compatible with um, all of the the um, STR kits that are used um, commercially. So, both the uh, identifiers, profiler, cofiler, and then also the PowerPlex kits. Um, the, the system that we've developed is really optimized for forensics applications, as you can see, um, to perform up to about 500 bases, to get high resolution, good sensitivity, high precision, and, um, and it forms the basis for the integration that we'll be performing in the, in the next, next steps. I guess, um, do you guys have any questions about this system? How do you discriminate between the different die sets if you're not using a different optical setup? Yeah, we'll talk about this in um, the next session, but uh, essentially, it's all the die sets have very distinct peaks. Um, so. I should say this, all the die sets, th it comes out that um, if, if you were to look at all the, the kits and the number of dies that are available, there are approximately six or eight dies that are used. You know, some dies overlap between kits. And the, the peak wavelengths for the dies are all located within a small wavelength range, you know, somewhere around 520 nanometers up to 650 for LIS, but LIS itself is very long wavelength. So by using one set of optical, um, the second thing is that um, when, when these kits are designed, the, the dies are actually physically spaced quite far apart. They try to put, if it's a four die kit, they space the four dies as far as they can. If it's a five die kit, they space the five dies as far as they can. So that if you look at the dichroic um, mirror setup that's used for discriminating two dies, it is possible that regardless of which kit you pick, you can pick a set of dichroic mirrors so that it'll operate equivalently for all the kits at the same time. And that takes a bit of optimization, but uh, um, what it ends up doing is allow, uh, allowing you to run all of the kits at the same time on the same chip if you want, or um, just focusing on one kit at a time. Yeah, I, did I answer the question? I'd like we to see can work. <laughs> yeah, we can go into more detail, but uh, the um, sort some of the data that we generate here, for example, um, you know, both with the four die kit and the five die kit, they're all on the same instrument, and essentially there's just run after run. You know, we'll load a identifier sixteen, mm -hmm. and then the next run we can load a profiler set and just run it with the same detector setup, same um, separation conditions, so on and so forth mirror that separates red and yellow and it'll separate any red from any yellow. Generally, but yeah, that's right. There, the red and red and yellow on the different kits are usually not so different that uh, if you can separate red and yellow from one kit, 
it'll most likely, and in our case, it will separate red and yellow from another kid. Although specifically, the red on one kid is not exactly the same as the other kid, or the yellow from one kid's not the same as the yellow on the other kid. This range of reds or this range of reds. Right, right. Have you tried any YSTRs? We've not tried any no. YSTRs. Uh, um, we actually haven't, uh, haven't purchased any of those kits, but if there are any samples that uh, you're interested in testing, we'd be happy to just make a run. Oh, really? Yeah. Because I think the YSTR kits use the same dyes, dye sets, so um, it's just a matter of making sure that the uh, allele interpretation software has the right um, loci in it, and then we could do the analysis. One of the important things for the acceptance of any new system is that NDIS will accept it for use. Where are you on that? Well, that's a good question. So there, we haven't done a lot of work on this yet, mainly because um, our, our target is the fully integrated system. Um, and, and in terms of NDIS, uh, you know, I think you know more about this than I do, and it's probably a First of all, some validation that has to go on, and then uh, um, that'll involve studies, comparison between this instrument to conventional systems, and then also a publications of uh, instrument data to show that it's <coughs> been uh, peer-reviewed and accepted. So in terms of that, um, we're starting to publish, because we know that's, that's important. We're starting to publish on the data from this instrument and um, the work that we're doing. And then we're also in the early stages of trying to work with labs, forensics lab, that have, that can help us either with this portion of the work, you know, supplying samples, helping us with the analysis, running samples on the standard instruments, and then our, our instruments. So we're in the sort of the early stages of that, trying to identify um, groups that can help us or want to collaborate with us on this. So there's no intent to just bring the separation detection device to market as a standalone product? Um, not unless there's, um, so our, our, our primary goal is not to, to just sell or market this particular device, um, which is why we call it module three of one of three modules. Um, and, and at the same time, although it's complete, we haven't really marketed it for uh, general consumption. But um, what we do try to do is uh, make it available to sort of thought leaders or practitioners in the field in, in some type of limited or controlled quantities so that we don't have a huge support staff that has to run around, um, deal with these instruments. Um, but uh, to supply them in limited quantities or controlled quantities to practitioners in the field to really get feedback about the system, to get data about the system, and then to sort of have these early adopters or early users of it help us bring it into the, the you know, ENDIS or validation portions. So I guess um, I'm running a little bit ahead. That's good. <laughs> um, so we can stop here and uh,